Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India we are going to look at popular culture that comes in the printed form. There are many uh, things one can discuss under this topic. Uh, for instance, magazines, uh, work of fiction, work of non-fiction, all those self-help books that are very popular. Uh, many things can come under what is considered to be popular in print. And also, um, a historical perspective can also be taken because unlike technologies um, uh, such as television or radio or cinema um, or the digital, uh, this form of media has been around for quite some time now. So there is already a lot of literature available about uh, media in the print form. Um, in this uh, discussion, we will focus more on the kinds of ethnographic works that have been done um, to enable us to understand uh, how people engage with popular culture when it is in the form of a printed object. Um, and um, not all of this research has been done by um, anthropologists necessarily, there are also people who are from diverse disciplines like visual art, um, sociology uh, and literature. But uh, largely um, what I have uh, tried to do is to get work from people who have used ethnographic method as um, a method to understand what is um, going on here. So what we will predominantly concentrate on are um, uh, works of fiction or uh, which is easy to understand as popular fiction. What will be, um, what people will be amazed with is sometimes who the writers are. Um, and we have this image of uh, popular fiction writers being very young and um, uh, you know out in the world kind of people. But sometimes uh, these are also very senior uh, men and women who are uh, writing. For instance, one of the most popular uh, female writers of fiction in Tamil is a woman called Ramani Chandran who writes under the name of Ramani Chandran and a very senior woman whose um, works are extremely popular. We see these uh, popular works available in bookstalls, um, in, at the airport, in the railway stations, in malls, in many places where people congregate. Clearly they are very popular. Then the question for us as uh, scholars and researchers is, what makes them popular? Who is the audience? Who is buying these books and reading them? Um, of course, not all popular books uh, fall into one genre. Uh, there are many uh, books written by uh, foreign authors in English, for example, that are hugely popular in India, far more than they may be popular in their own um, uh, worlds where these writers come from. Um, and um, so they span a uh, range of genres. There is crime fiction, um, there is a romance, uh, there is horror, there is also science fiction, which is um, science fiction is extremely popular too. Um, in here uh, for the discussion today, I am taking work done on popular romance fiction, um, which also has a very interesting uh, gendering there going on about the writers, about the readers and about the content. So like I said, Ramani Chandran writes in Tamil. Um, there are also a lot of authors who write in um, other uh, regional languages like Hindi and uh, many other languages in India. Uh, the most popular one that 
um, English speaking audience uh, readers would know um, will be the Mills and Boone um, um, public publications, the, the books that come under this category called Mills and Boone novels. Um, so, these novels um, have a huge fan following and have had a readership for a long time in India now, many decades. Um, so, there are women who have read Mills and Boone novel and then there are two or three generations who have also read um, a Mills and Boone novels. What makes them so popular? Who are um, the people uh, that are found in these novels? Now, um, if we go a little bit back in history to understand if there is any ancestry at all um, that will help us place these novels in context, one can go back um, to works of authors like Jane Austen. Um, who, uh, whose work Pride and Prejudice is one of the most famous, but she has many um, works to her credit. Um, and from then onwards, a notion of uh, intimacy, a notion of um, uh, liking between um, a man and a woman, a notion of compatibility between a man and a woman. There was a lot of intimacy one could uh, read in Pride and Prejudice, but there was certainly an idea being given that um, a, a good partnership, a good relationship um, should be based upon a mutual understanding and knowing each other and compatibility and that kind of a relationship uh, should be able to cross um, barriers that society has. So, we know that in Pride and Prejudice, uh, the heroine uh, Elizabeth comes from what we may call a middle class uh, background compared to uh, the male lead who comes from an extremely rich background. Uh, even so, uh, through the pro novel, we can see how their relationship uh, goes through uh, various points of uh, disjuncture, misunderstandings and then finally, um, they succeed in coming together. Uh, one can argue that, um, that these kind of works of literature um, were the precursors to what we understand uh, the romance uh, novels uh, to be. Um, but also other writers uh, like Elizabeth Gaskell who wrote about, uh, who wrote a book, book called uh, North and South um, and also a series of works uh, chronicling Victorian um, period in England um, in works like Cranford for example. Um, uh, the reason why they are still popular even today is that there has been a translation of these works from uh, literature to television and film, particularly in England. Um, one such uh, series of Jane Austen's work on uh, Pride and Prejudice, uh, which is hugely popular with audience even now, is the 1995 production by the BBC uh, called Pride and Prejudice uh, that made um, uh, the character of Darcy uh, very um, uh, popular um, across the world and the actor playing it Colin Firth also um, a, a very popular. Um, you may also remember that uh, a film which came many years later, uh, Bridget Jones's Diary um, has uh, the lead uh, um, uh, male actor called as Darcy and incidentally it is also played by Colin Firth who played the character of Darcy in Pride and Prejudice in 1995. Um, and so, this is to say that uh, some these characters last, last a long time, they are in people's minds and this idea uh, that um, one can overlook class differences um, or any other kind of difference. Uh, if there is um, compatibility and a sense of companionship, um, and then that is what one should desire for has been there for some time and uh, um, still quite popular. And this is the kind of 
audience um, that uh, form the readers of Mills and Boone novels. Uh, I am not drawing a, a direct correlation between readers of Jane Austen novels and readers of Mills and Boone novels because clearly uh, we do not ha have any uh, evidence at least from research point of view that these are the same people who are reading both, they may or they may not. But what I am trying to say here is this gives the um, uh, for a possibility of a certain kind of readership which then um, Mills and Boone novels uh, capitalize on. So, Jyoti Puri who is a sociologist um, has done um, a study on such readers. Uh, she interviewed young people uh, in colleges uh, in Mumbai and uh, conducted um, a written survey uh, with a questionnaire and also in depth interviews. Um, uh, what she found was that even if they were very young women somewhere between 19 to 21 years, so they mu must have been in undergraduate or early postgraduate um, degrees, um, a lot of them did expect to confirm uh, two notions of marriage and motherhood. Um, so, they did assume that um, eventually uh, they will get married and uh, they will um, have a family and, uh, and a lot of them also um, assumed uh, that the marriages uh, may be arranged, but desired um, what we now um, call more often marriages of choice or companionate marriages. Marriages uh, which are decided with some input from the, the people who are going to get married, uh, particularly the girl, the woman. In India, most marriages as we know there is a lot of statistical evidence also out there, uh, most marriages are arranged uh, by their families, uh, largely within their own uh, socio-economic and cultural groups and maybe also um, with regional uh, and geographic um, similarities as well and linguistic similarities. So, a lot of people, um, uh, particularly women, uh, do not expect that um, you know they will be able to marry someone totally different, um, whether they will even be able to meet and then like and then be liked in return and then marry someone completely different from their own immediate uh, socio-cultural setting. However, in the research that, that uh, Jyoti Puri did, a lot of women um, did express a desire that uh, they, they wish that their marriages would be uh, marriages of choice, where they are able to be able to say uh, yes or no uh, to the person. So, uh, this person may be someone that the family will introduce to them or it might be someone that they meet and then come to know. Either way, a marriage of choice was expressed as a desire, but largely they expected um, that it would be a marriage uh, arranged by families. So, why uh, are women's ideas about marriage uh, important in understanding uh, popular fiction? Because the top, the subjects of these uh, fictional works are all about romance. They are all about a man and a woman meeting each other, um, trying to understand or misunderstand mostly and then figure out um, that they are uh, well suited for each other, fall in love and uh, finally succeed in, um, in their relationship by marriage or whatever. So, lot of these novels are focused on romance per se and therefore, um, ideas uh, of what kind of marriages uh, these women wish to have um, or expect, um, their aspirations and dreams and desires are very important for us to place their reading habit of popular fiction in that context. So, without understanding this, it will not be 
um, really um, enough for us to just conduct a survey of uh, you know what are the kinds of books you are reading and come to some conclusion. That alone will not tell us much. We have to see what they are reading along with what kind of notions they have about what they are reading. For example, romance. And unsurprisingly, most of the women also stuck to a very high heteronormative understanding of uh, marriage uh, and relationship. Um, they also um, expressed a lot of anxiety. They were quite anxious about what kind of marriages they will have, uh, what kind of persons they will marry, how will married life turn out to be. Um, these things caused considerable anxiety and in many cases um, these novels uh, were a way uh, to address those anxieties. Um, uh, one of the findings of this study is that there is definitely there is a lot of pleasure that um, the women um, acquire by being able to read all fiction, particularly romance fiction, but more importantly what they talked to Jyoti Puri about was the kind of anxieties that they had about their future life. One of the things that makes them um, easily relate to um, um, the the context of these novels, we should remember that a lot of Mills and Boone novels have protagonists who are not necessarily from India. They are located elsewhere, you know, they are ethnically, racially and in many other contexts very different people. And yet, uh, what these women found relatable was um, that mostly uh, women married up what is called in anthropology um, as a hypergamy. Um, that is women from middle class, uh, uh, not poor necessarily, but mostly middle class backgrounds will always end up marrying um, this uh, man who will be extremely rich. So uh, ideas about hypergamy were reinforced, they were not necessarily challenged. Another point to remember here, popular culture should not always be seen only as resistance. It can also be a text um, that allows for reinforcement of cultural notions of hierarchy. Um, so that was uh, something they could understand. Uh, another point was a lot of women felt that they need not have to make decisions about whether they should work or not after marriage because in a lot of these novels women were uh, working women um, uh, with the relationship going on. So a lot of women felt that that might be possible, possible for them as well. That they may be able to have a job and have a marriage and be happy in that marriage and be liked by their um, husbands. Um, one of the problems that uh, these women encountered in reading romance fiction is that romance fiction is believed to be trashy. Lot of people think that it is not very good kind of literature one should be reading. Um, though reading for the sake of um, uh, understanding English or uh, gaining fluency in English was encouraged, um, these novels were looked down upon. Um, because of their focus on relationships. So a lot of uh, women um, were um, much constrained in where they could read and how they could read because family members did not approve, in most cases did not approve of women uh, reading these novels. How do women get access? I mean lot of circulation libraries um, that we have in the cities particularly have amongst all kinds of fiction, they also have this uh, genre as well. So that is how women are able to access it. But reading together um, is, is a not uh, a possibility here. In some um, cases uh, they felt, of course these women are telling the researcher what they think their family is thinking. 
So, the researcher is not necessarily talking to the parents or family members of the girls who are reading uh, Mills and Boone novels. The researcher is only talking to girls who are reading Mills and Boone novels and asking them about uh, family members or what constraints they have. Um, so, one of the constraints they mentioned was that the families were concerned that these kind of works might encourage a desire for a kind of life that may not actually be possible in real. That is um, a kind of desire for romance uh, to be liked by the husband, uh, it may not materialize and then the girl will be hugely disappointed. So, that was also the girls believed that that was a concern that their families had. Um, so, what happens then with all these constraints if they are reading these novels, their desires and aspirations remain at the level of the individual. So, they want to work after marriage, they want to continue working after marriage, they do not see marriage as um, a, a point, a rupture in their lives as career women um, or they want to go on studying or whatever. But because it is at the level of the individual, um, the, the manifestation of these desires in their lives might vary from one person to another. So, there is not any kind of collective um, thinking uh, going on here, this is just at the level of the individual. They also like uh, one can see with many other kinds of popular culture uh, where women are at the core, whether it is television or cinema or fashion, confidence is appreciated, aggression is not. So, the heroines of these novels are also women who are very confident, but eventually if they cross a line they are uh, tamed, uh, because women readers also do not want them becoming too confident, that may not be good for the relationship, that is what they feel. But a more important, one important point that the author mentions also is these are feminine representations of male expectations of femininity. These women who are reading and possibly women who are writing them are all writing in some sense imagining and creating a male understanding of femininity um, which is then getting represented in the novels, whether that is really how men look at women or how men understand femininity to be, we do not know. Not from this um, study of readers of popular romance novels, because the readers happen to be women too. Um, a lot of women also thought that men will be like how they are reading in the novel, I mean the, the same way um, as they appear in novels there will be a lot of similarities between men because this is probably how men think and how men would react. These are the assumptions um, also. Um, so, this notion of romantic love uh, that is very strongly emphasized um, in all these uh, novels was emphasized in uh, Pride and Prejudice uh, also which is uh, 200 year, years uh, more uh, earlier um, have a particular context. So, in Europe and America industrialization and capitalism, expansion of capitalism, all these caused significant changes in people's life, in their social structure, um, due to migration, due to new kinds of employment, lots of things changed. Now, what factors can we attribute? this um, reading of romance novels in India. What has changed? Why are, uh, in what context are women placing uh, these novels? Um, um, because we know that that kind of drastic departure which occurred with industrialization in 18th century England for instance, um, does not, I mean it does not happen in such a drastic manner um, here, but of course here there is a larger context in which these kind of uh, fictional works start appearing 
and that is uh, colonial um, uh, administration coming to India, the British colonial administration, um, widespread uh, understanding knowledge of the English language, schools and colleges, though very few still they are beginning to appear in the 19th century. So, we have uh, uh, studies of um, magazines for example, being very popular with women um, in 19th century Bengal. Uh, because a new middle class is emerging, uh, women are beginning to learn English and then these magazines become popular. So, that is the context from which uh, I mean the link uh, comes from there to later on works of fiction as well. Of course, in, in the immediate uh, contemporary India that uh, we are located in, these novels have to be also placed in the larger discussions on globalization. Just like any other form of um, idea or uh, thought that flows from one part of the world to another, notions of romance also do travel and do have an impact, um, which is why we emphasize that one should not see globalization only through the um, a lens of trade and commerce. Um, people's attitudes and desires also are um, going through huge amounts of change with new ideas uh, coming in and people reacting to these um, notions. What we know less of is uh, men's understanding, um, uh, the male understanding of romance. Um, of masculinity and femininity um, and we also have less uh, of such works from anthropology, we have more from psychology or from literature, um, history and from advertising, um, you know where they are looking at advertisements in popular magazines as a way of understanding what is going on. But we need a lot more research like this uh, coming from, uh, from an anthropological perspective in order to place it um, more firmly in the socio-cultural context. Um, but even so, uh, this uh, work by Jyoti Puri and other authors that I will talk about um, now um, tell us about ideas of romance and relationship, um, the expectations women have in a globalizing uh, turn of the century, early 20th, 21st century India. We can certainly place it in that context, a middle class, urban, English speaking, uh, college educated um, women readership. Uh, that is where these works are located, as is um, another work by Kirsten Rudis Kristen Rudisil. Uh, which is uh, from the southern uh, city of Chennai, um, where she looks at a new um, series of publications called um, uh, Red uh, 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 Publications, Page Turn Publisher is the name of the publisher and these books um, aim to capture in the words of the editor of this uh, a study, uh, the publication, they aim to capture those readers who are reading Mills and Boone novels, but aim to give them a more Indian um, context. What that means? That means that these novels are, are located in India, geographically the setting is India, the protagonists are Indian, the issues are largely what one would uh, come across amongst Indian families. So, that way um, uh, the editor who started this, uh, the publisher uh, who started collecting um, stories for the series uh, firmly believed that um, this will be successful. So, this um, new publication started from 2009. Um, so, they on the one hand they wanted to uh, promote um, what they call Indian values, 
On the other hand, they also wanted to promote uh, some understanding of uh, rights. Uh, you know, that a woman, for example, should not be forced into a relationship without her consent, that the woman's voice should come through. Um, such, uh, I mean, it is not like English uh, novels about romance were not written before. Shobha Day is a very well known writer who has indeed um, written novels um, on many topics including romance. Um, however, um, in this uh, series what they aim to capture is not just about the elite or what is going on in the film world or fashion world or something, but what uh, many women will be able to re relate to. Um, what uh, you know somebody is a, a secretary in some office or someone is a photographer, a wedding photographer. Um, these kind of um, job opportunities um, allow for what they call as relatability, whether women are able to relate. Another thing also these novels were they were not 200 or 300 rupees, they were all below 100 rupees, so more affordable like campus novels. Um, and also um, what uh, this red romance series um, wanted to give was more believable romance where here also uh, women are not rebellious but independent minded women. So, they are they will be very firm in what they want to say, but they are not necessarily going to be trailblazers and challenge uh, the no. Um, and also a very uh, strongly emphasis was laid on bringing the relationship uh, to a closure by making the two leads um, find each other and end it in end the story with marriage or them coming together. So, the, the, the protagonists are not in a limbo, a story will not end with a woman deciding to end the relationship and go um, do something else. Um, it will have a happy ending, but the authors claim that uh, the, the romance will be more relatable than Mills and Boone um, kind of romance. Um, but, uh, in the end what the, the publisher said is that they aim to give, uh, they aim to give voice to an Indian fantasy. Mills and Boone novels are about um, a fantasy about romance from the western world. Here the red romance series of um, novels aim to tell us what they would Indian fantasy of romance look like? What would it be like if we were to do more relatable, more believable um, stories? So, how did they make these stories believable? For one, families played a very important role. So, unlike Mills and Boone novels where there will be very few characters, but a lot of focus will be on the male and female uh, lead characters. In these um, Desi romance as uh, they are called, um, uh, the families of the protagonists also come into the picture as it would, um, it would be in real life. Language, uh, the, the style of writing and language is also what is uh, seen to be Indian English. That is people uh, speak. Um, uh, people write in the way they speak. Uh, they speak English, but they speak it the way Indians speak English. It is not American English or British English that we will read in these novels. Um, the other aspect is also uh, in terms of characterization. So, for instance, uh, men are not always very tall. Um, you know, the, the publisher uh, tells um, uh, Rudisil about uh, you know how she wanted to portray men the way they look in India, how the way Indian men actually look and not everybody is tall and therefore not every girl is going to aspire to, ma to marry um, or fall in love with a man because he is very tall. So, that those kind of small um, uh, changes were done 
uh, to make this series uh, successful. Bringing in family, showing people in their physical features uh, more in common with how Indians think other Indians look like. Um, the settings are more relatable, their careers are more relatable and it is also mostly about some kind of middle class, upper middle class life. It is not necessarily about the life of the rich and famous. Um, so that way this romance is projected, a particular kind of romance which is rightly called Desi romance by the publisher is being projected onto the readers. So, uh, like one of the authors, uh, one of the readers said, these um, um, novels allow for a Mills and Boone life in India itself. You do not have to necessarily read a Mills and Boone novel where the, the female and male protagonists are Americans located in, United, uh, in America doing something you know in a ranch or some such which a middle class urban English educated girl in India can, can relate to in some sense what she relates to if we look at uh, Jyoti Puri's work they relate to the idea of romance. But in uh, this uh, red romance novel series, what the readers are relating to are not just the idea of romance, um, but also uh, the kind of situations in which romance can be possible in India. So that is what they are focusing on. Uh, so, these are two studies that are based in India, but really the most um, quoted uh, study um, by um, a scholar on romance uh, fiction is that of Janice Radway, um, who um, wrote a book um, called Women Reading uh, Romance, Reading Romance. So, that book was about these women in United States uh, reading romance novels and sharing their ideas about what is it in these novels that um, appeals to them. One theme which ca uh, came out uh, most often in many of her interviews um, is that of escape. So, she gives several quotes in that um, book um, and articles about um, you know how it, it allows them to escape their harsh world, it allows them to take a bit of a vacation, um, there is so much pressure and therefore uh, in one's everyday life there is a lot of pressure and therefore these novels are an escape, um, escaping from everyday life. Um, so, um, these uh, novels predominantly seem to address that notion of wanting to escape. So, it does not, so romance itself is uh, seems to be secondary to um, the first desire which is to just escape, but then they can escape and read any kind of fiction. If fiction is what allows one to escape reality then one can read any kind of fiction, right? So, why is romance fiction um, uh, primarily uh, consisting of female readers? Why is it assumed that women form the major bulk of readership for romance novels and romance novels are written for women? What is now some in many ways um, called as um, um, chick lit uh, literature or something like that um, and movies are also classified that way. Romantic comedies are always assumed to have a huge viewership amongst women whereas it might just be that a lot of men also watch um, these movies which is why I mentioned that what we really miss in uh, popular culture studies on fiction um, especially with regard to India is our understandings of what men really engage with in their reading of popular uh, fiction or non-fiction. Anyway, coming back to Janice Radway's work, she has these quotes about 
um, a woman, you know, who is running and dropping children in school, picking children up from school, taking them to the dentist, washing clothes. Um, and then she feels like uh, she's not being heard, that, that everyone assumes that she's not doing much work because she's staying at home. And um, while it is not clear, particularly um, from Jyotipuri's uh, research and Rudisil's work, whether a lot of readers, um, Jyotipuri's re research was amongst college going students, but it is quite possible that uh, the books are being read by uh, women who are not just students. Um, and e the same goes for uh, women reading the Red Romance series as well, or the women reading uh, Tamil uh, romance novels written by Ramani Chandran. Who are they? Are they all homemakers, the same readers that Janice Radway talks about in her work in United States? Uh, does the bulk of readership for romance fiction come from uh, women who are homemakers who feel like they have, um, they are not being heard, they are not being seen as working and this allows them a form of escape? Is that um, a possibility? So that is one question. Um, and also can we see uh, the mere act of reading um, these novels as a kind of resistance, um, even if they do not go outright and um, 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 argue for it. Um, and in what way can we situate this um, kind of reading with other engagements that women have? Uh, with uh, popular culture. Uh, what is, um, what would be the relationship between the kind of fiction women read and the kind of movies they watch and the kind of um, television programs they watch? A lot of um, uh, people assume, for instance, with regard to television programs in particular, that these programs are just seen by um, uh, women who are um, housewives, homemakers. They are called housewives more commonly in India and uh, a lot of people assume that and tell so as well that this is being made for them. Um, these are aunties sitting at home and watching um, these works uh, of fiction on television. And uh, these kind of assumptions are also um, not very helpful in understanding the exact ways in which um, the, the readers or viewers create meaning out of um, this engagement they have. If fiction is creating an unreal world or a world different from what they inhabit, what is their engagement with this other world and what is causing, what is enabling it and what are the takeaways that happen and how is the world of fiction responding? to this readership. If uh, what, from what um, the publisher of Red Romance told uh, Rudisil, uh, it is a significant departure from the kind of stories that Milson Boone um, series talks about, which means that the, the, the world of fiction has to at the end of the day engage with its readership, change the content change the format and change the settings in order to be viable and in order to be read. So one can ask all of these questions when looking at works, these three major um, research studies that have been done on women readers of uh, romance fiction um, to ask whether it is really an escape as much as uh, people uh, think it is. Um, in what way is it an escape, if at all it is an escape? And what kind of other forms of aspirations and desires are being created or even frustrations being given voice to um, by these readers and writers? So we also um, need to uh, look at the motivations uh, from writers to engage with these kind of um, works of fiction. Of course, not all of uh, popular media that is in print is about fiction. 
Um, another popular form um, that, uh, that is consumed in print is uh, calendars for example. And I will briefly uh, talk about um, calendar art um, uh, which has been um, studied in India uh, by a scholar called Kajri Jain. Um, so, in Kajri Jain's work um, which she calls Gods in the Bazaar, um, she is looking at the kind of images um, of uh, deities which appear in calendars and then you know which are in the marketplace. So, we can all recall uh, seeing um, a prints of uh, these uh, Raja Ravi Varma paintings of various Hindu deities, either standalone prints which are then framed and kept uh, for worship or um, as um, associated with calendars, daily calendars. Therefore, the company's name will be printed on this uh, calendar. So, you know you have Woodward's gripe water with uh, baby uh, Krishna or uh, sunlight soap with uh, Vishnu um, on Garuda. Uh, so, uh, but basically these images came about uh, because they were part of daily calendars which after the year is over um, is removed and then uh, these images are also framed. But what um, happens when images come into print? Um, so, once images are available in print and then they are in circulation, what, what happens there? You know, what um, kind of value um, are these images then acquiring as they move from one setting to another setting? First in the um, place where they are uh, printed and then to the um, the manufacturer of these calendars or prints and then into the homes of people. Um, what values uh, do they acquire in different settings? Another question which occupies these uh, uh, printers minds, the people who are engaged in this is about copyright. Um, you know who has actually the copyright uh, for these images? Uh, what is more important? the artist who came up with this image or the image itself. You know what do we go give more um, uh, prominence for? And uh, calendar art is also a place where technology is coming um, in close contact with art itself. So, what uh, processes occur there? So, um, it is not that uh, before calendar uh, art came into existence, there were no uh, images of uh, religious figures circulating. Uh, we have to, we can uh, think of Tanjore paintings or Patachitra or other forms of uh, paintings where uh, religious images were um, available. Um, but what Print, um, printing of these calendars did um, was to make it available in large numbers to uh, many people. So, once um, it is available at that level, it is a ritual object, but it is also a commodity. So, the interface between image as a ritual object and image as a commodity um, is uh, is more pertinent particularly when we look at calendar art. Um, so, you know what is sacred, what is profane um, and how does one understand? What do you do with an image which has uh, the picture of a deity, uh, but at the bottom has the name of uh, a soap company or something? You know what is, is it a commodity, is it uh, for uh, ritual consumption? Um, so, um, Jane traces the sort of um, history of how this form uh, comes into being and particularly uh, the be beginning of uh, uh, factories and uh, companies in Sivagasi in Tamil Nadu in the 1950s and 60s where these calendars get mass produced. And there the, the people in the industry took care of to do two things. One is about the image of the deity 
which uh, has to subscribe to what is understood to be auspicious. And the second point that they were very careful about is that no image should be repeated by the same person, by the same company at least. So, um, and these images are also gifts in some sense, right? Because nobody will charge a person for distributing calendars. Um, as soon as the new year arrives or even before, by the last week of December, people start distributing these calendars to various homes. Um, uh, local shops will distribute uh, to people in and around their regular customers. So in a, one essence, it is a gift. And in another essence, it is also um, an activity done with um, a particular perspective of increasing clientele or keeping the clientele loyal to you. Um, one, um, what happened when these calendar uh, images first started appearing is uh, Raja Ravi Verma's prints are the most famous and usually um, what they consist of is the figure, the figure of the deity is more prominent in the uh, foreground and the background is usually very decorative and there is a lot of use of bright colors. Uh, however, at the end of the day, people who buy um, these calendars are the ones who will have to look at the appropriateness of the image. Uh, so appropriateness can range from whether the eyes have been placed in the right position, is the, is the smile all right. People have different ways of is assessing what is appropriateness, um, but these images are not just accepted um, without any um, critique. Um, but uh, these uh, printers also um, feel very frustrated actually because they cannot really uh, change too much uh, because every year it will be one deity and um, eventually the foreground is always the deities. Um, at the background they can change a little bit um, and slowly what they have started doing uh, nowadays is not just rendering the Ravi Verma paintings um, just uh, like that, but also um, uh, depicting deities from different temples. So that way there is a lot of variety that's going around. Um, but uh, what calendar art um, really does is in some sense um, uh, mediating between advertisement and auspiciousness. Uh, it is a form of advertisement definitely for the companies that are giving them out. Um, but also um, there is um, some kind of auspiciousness um, allotted, uh, uh, configured, placed upon the deity who forms the subject of this um, calendar. One problem that Raja Ravi Verma faced during his time itself is copyright. The moment his prints became available, they were reproduced and reproduced. And um, artists will sign, but they will still be um, uh, reproduced. The same image will be reproduced with the signature of a different artist. Um, so the, the understanding of plagiarism um, is, is very different here. Uh, why so? Because um, these images of deities are supposed to be available to everyone. You know, it's, a, it's in the comments, it's available to all. So no one person can hold copyright um, for that image. But what also we learn from looking at calendar art uh, through the ages is how much dynamism there is. So the kind of variety we see in the way these um, gods and goddesses are depicted over a period of time shows that even though it is um, a reproduction of a mythological or religious character, um, there is a huge amount of creativity which goes into the way in which uh, they are being uh, depicted. 
Um, another thing obviously is a lot of social groups are involved in circulation of um, and these calendar art. Uh, there is tremendous amount of network uh, between communities across the country and uh, uh, therefore, it uh, provides a very rich uh, network for us to analyze as to who are all in this um, um, business of circulating calendar art. What would make it more interesting now with digitization is now what kind of images are being reproduced um, uh, with new technologies becoming available. An artist does not have to paint them and then print them and then mass produce them. Um, but when images are digitally uh, brought into life, uh, what kind of new moral economies become established? That would be um, um, a subject for a future study. Uh, but largely in our, um, in this discussion on popular fiction and popular calendar, uh, popular culture as in print, what we realize is um, uh, the kind of uh, issues uh, that have been um, discussed in many kinds of uh, popular culture. Um, uh, genres exist here as well. Uh, popular culture themes are probably the same, uh, confirming to tradition, expressing modernity, pushing the boundaries but not exactly going all the way out, resistance, um, but uh, co-opting um, the norm, all of these things are uh, being expressed here and engaged with back and forth between the various stakeholders.